Hey, everybody, and welcome to XSTEM All Access. I'm Justin Schaefer, and I'm excited to be your moderator yet again for this exciting virtual series. Today is the fourth session of a five-day series brought to you by the USA Science and Engineering Festival. The mission of the USA Science and Engineering Festival is to inspire the next generation, that's you, to pursue careers in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM. You can check out their other programs and events at usasciencefestival.org. Don't forget to mark your calendar for this time tomorrow, May 19th, for the final segment of this program. Over the course of the series, we've been getting up close and personal with a number of STEM trailblazers. I hope you're ready to be inspired by their stories and maybe even motivated to follow your own path in STEM. You guys are coming to us from all over the world. We have attendees from Washington, D.C., California, Ohio, Colorado, Alabama, Kentucky, Massachusetts, Puerto Rico, Alaska, and more. Plus, international attendees are joining us from Nigeria, Greece, Spain, Egypt, India, England, Mexico, and even more. Welcome to everybody. I'm here in New York City, and I'm excited to have you guys ready to rock with me as we engage with STEM. I'd like to take a moment to recognize our sponsor, AstraZeneca. A big thanks to AstraZeneca for their generous support of this XSTEM All Access Virtual Conference Series. Before we jump into today's session, I'd like to share a little bit about myself. Like I said, my name is Justin Schaefer, but I also go by Mr. Fascinate. You guys can follow me on Instagram at Mr. Fascinate. And it is my mission to excite young people like you guys about STEM. I've traveled all over the world to do that. And I've also created a bunch of virtual content, including my own animated series. I'm also a part-time doctoral student at Columbia University. And I'm working right now to build the Magic Cool Bus, a mobile STEM lab that's going to travel all over New York City and excite kids about STEM. So follow me at Mr. Fascinate, like I said, and engage with me and join my mission to get young people into STEM. Now let's get started with today's program. Our theme for today is science that saves lives. Now more than ever, we can appreciate the doctors and scientists who keep us healthy. If you have a parent or loved one who works on the front lines of medicine, a doctor or nurse or medical related personnel, why don't we take a moment to recognize them? Why don't we give them all a virtual high five and a round of applause? I'll wait and I'll give some round of applause myself. Great job, doctors. We appreciate your service. In this segment, we will hear from medical oncologist and drug discoverer, Dr. Mika Sobak and neuroscientist, Dr. Greg Gage. In addition, we have two very special guest appearances by infectious disease researcher and director of the NIAID, Dr. Anthony Fauci and NIH director, Dr. Francis Collins. Speaking of our special guests, we're going to hear from one of them right now to kick off today's program. There is no doubt that you've seen Dr. Anthony Fauci in the news lately. He's an infectious disease researcher who has been on the forefront of the coronavirus pandemic and has become a trusted source of information. In his role as director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, Dr. Fauci has advised six U.S. presidents on numerous domestic and global health issues. Given his very busy schedule these days, I'm honored that he has taken time to join us today. I'm excited to welcome one of our special guests for today, Dr. Anthony Fauci. Greetings from the National Institutes of Health. My name is Dr. Tony Fauci. I am a physician, a medical researcher, and the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the National Institutes of Health, the NIH as we call it, here in Bethesda, Maryland. As many of you know, I was scheduled to speak to you live at the USA Science and Engineering Festival in Washington, D.C. about my career in medical research and the work my colleagues and I are doing to fight infectious diseases and diseases of the immune system. Even though I cannot be with you in person, let me give you a virtual and shorter version of what I had planned to share with you. I began my career doing research on diseases of the immune system. And as a young physician scientist, I helped develop cures for inflammatory diseases of blood vessels called vasculitis that previously had been fatal for many patients. I thought that I would spend the rest of my career in that realm. Then, seemingly out of nowhere, my life took a turn when a mysterious new disease emerged in 1981. AIDS, which as you know, is caused by a virus called HIV. The early years of AIDS were dark times as we had very little to offer our patients. However, 
with hard work and a lot of brain power, NIH scientists and researchers at universities and companies around the world develop treatments that allow people with HIV to live long and healthy lives. Since AIDS emerged, I have been involved in the fight against many other emerging infectious diseases, such as West Nile virus, SARS, a disease caused by a novel coronavirus, the 19, 2009 influenza pandemic, and another disease caused by a coronavirus, MERS. More recently, my institute played a key role in the fight against the Ebola virus in West Africa, and then the Democratic Republic of the Congo. I am happy to say that we now have two treatments for Ebola, as well as a vaccine. Now, as you know, we are facing what is perhaps our biggest challenge yet, another novel coronavirus. This one causes the disease called COVID-19. We are making good progress at NIH and at labs around the world in developing new tools to diagnose, prevent, and treat COVID-19. As you may have heard, a clinical trial has just shown that an antiviral treatment called remdesivir can help hospitalize patients with COVID-19. I am optimistic that we will soon have other interventions to fight this disease. In particular, good progress is being made to develop a vaccine in our NIH labs and in labs around the world. Meanwhile, thank you for doing your part by following social distancing guidelines and wearing a mask to keep yourselves healthy and to keep your loved ones safe, especially people whose immune systems may be weakened by disease or immunosuppressive medications. Growing up, I was privileged to have many teachers and mentors who encouraged my interest in science, starting as a young boy in Brooklyn, New York, and through high school and college. It is encouraging to see that science programs like these are working to inspire the next generation of scientists and finding innovative ways to reach you, including virtual events such as this. As my career suggests, new challenges to biomedical research such as COVID-19 are emerging all the time, even as we make progress against the many existing diseases that we face. This tells us that the need is greater than ever for our best and brightest students to pursue the sciences. And if you feel the calling to join the next generation of researchers who will develop the cures and vaccines that we badly need. I wish you the very best as you continue to study and learn in this difficult time. And I have every expectation that with hard work, you will find important and fulfilling work, whatever profession you choose. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the program. Super inspiring. A special thanks to Dr. Anthony Fauci for taking the time out of his very demanding schedule to speak with us today. Now let's get started with today's speakers. I'm excited to introduce our next guest, Dr. Minka, Dr. Minka Sovak. Dr. Sovak is a medical oncologist where she leads an incredibly talented team of drug developers with the goal to discover and develop new medicines for patients with cancer and one day to eliminate it altogether. That's a very bold and inspiring ambition that Dr. Sovak believes we will only achieve if we bring diversity of thought to the decision-making that aims to ultimately improve patients' lives. Dr. Mika Sovak, welcome to our program. Excellent. All right. Thanks, Justin, for the introduction. <laughs> yeah, no problem, Mika. I'm gonna let you go ahead and take it away. Sounds good, thanks a lot. Hi, everyone. Hope you're doing relatively well in this interesting new virtual world that we find ourselves in. And in that spirit, I'm hoping that you'll go on a little virtual backpacking trip with me today. All right, so as Justin said, uh, my name is Dr. Mika Sovak and I'm a medical oncologist, in other words, a cancer doctor and a drug discoverer at a large pharmaceutical company called AstraZeneca. Now, I often get the question, well, you're no longer seeing individual patients and you're not in the lab. So exactly what is it that you do? Well, it's true. I no longer see individual patients, but what I do do is I take care of large groups of patients with cancer by developing new medicines to treat their disease. 
So basically, my job is to transform science into medicine. Sounds pretty cool, right? But there's a question of, uh, but exactly what do you do every day? Well, if you ask my son, he would probably say that I spend the vast majority of my time in front of this computer talking to people. Uh, and he'd be right. And what I'm really doing is leading a group of over 100 people from a, lots of different backgrounds who have diverse experience. And together, we are the ones who actually have to solve this problem of how do we make better medicines to treat patients with cancer. And in order to do that, we have to understand the science. We have to understand the disease. We have to know what patients need and want and what physicians need and want. And furthermore, what do governments need to approve drugs and make sure that the patients can get access to them. And a large part of my job is to make sure that this diverse group of people can work together successfully. So to talk a little bit more about that, we're gonna go on a little bit of a virtual trip. Okay, so ready? So this is a picture of me uh, taken several years ago. Okay, it was a lot of years ago. Uh, but it was in the middle of a 10-day uh, backpacking trip through the Amazon rainforest. Now, you might be wondering, what does this have to do with a career in STEM? Well, let me tell you a little bit about this trip. There were only four of us on it, and we all had very different skills and different backgrounds. One of them was a professional mountaineer who knew exactly how much freeze-dried food we had to pack into our backpacks to survive for 10 days but had never stepped foot in an Amazon rainforest. Another one was an EMT who had training in wilderness medicine, which came in very handy when I sprained my ankle on the, what, on the very last day. Then we also had a local guide uh, from Bolivia, and he, with nothing other than a machete, was able to clear through pathways through the jungle. And then on the very last day, uh, uh, there on the very last day of our trip, uh, created a raft that sailed all four of us down the, sorry, I'm getting to say that you can't see my screen. So I'm gonna try that one more time. There we go. Sorry about that, technical difficulties. And we'll just try to make that a little bit bigger. Okay, here we go, people. Sorry about that. Um, so then it was the, sorry, going back to the local guide who was a Bolivian, um, and he was the one who uh, built together a raft so that we could all float out of um, the river to our pickup point on last day. And then there was me. I was in my late 20s and uh, the only woman on the trip and I was close to graduating uh, with an MD, PhD degree. But you know, the skill that came in the best, the skill that actually served me the best was the fact that I actually could speak enough Spanish to be able to communicate with all four people. And we ended up having quite an adventure. And the fact that we made it out alive and well is because we all had different experiences and different skills uh, and had to rely upon each other. And it's a pretty perfect metaphor for my career in STEM and some of the many things that I learned along the way. And three of these that I wanna talk to you about today are the value of information and skills, communication, and an appreciation. So let's talk a little bit more about these. So the importance of diverse information and skills. So. All of you are smart and you all like STEM, which is presumably why you're watching this today. Now let's just imagine uh, that you're actually at school. And if you think about this, you know, we're all smart in very different ways and that's really important. So if you imagine that you're actually at school and you could look around, maybe you have a friend who's a math whiz and another one who is um, really good at sketching and a third one who uh, is really good at science experiments. Well, those are all really great skills to have. And when it comes to say a math test, well then the math whiz is gonna be all set. But when you have to solve a slightly more complicated problem, 
Say that you actually have to build a drawbridge for a science fair program. Well, that's when the math whiz might be really good at figuring out what angles do you need. And then the one, uh, the sketch artist can actually draw different options of what the bridge might look like. And your friend who's really good at science experiments can figure out ways that you can test the different models to see which one works the best. And maybe at the very end, a fourth friend comes in and says, hey, you know, you're trying to connect that uh, island with a mainland. And there's a ton of dog lovers who live on that island and they're going to want to walk their dogs across the bridge. So it has to be dog friendly. And together you can build an amazing looking dog friendly drawbridge. And that is the value of bringing together people with different skills. Now, when you do that, it's also important, important that you all can really communicate well with each other. And that's the second point I want to talk about. Communication is both about speaking up and it's also about listening up. So think about this, you know, sometimes when you're in class and you're listening to what the teacher is saying, uh, you may have a question, but maybe you're going to stop and say, well, oh, you know, I don't want to ask that question because people might think that I'm not very smart. Remember, we are all smart about different things. And there is no smartest kid in the classroom. So what you, uh, when you actually ask a question, then what you're actually showing is that you are listening and that you're curious. And those are both really important things as well. Now, the other part of communication is listening up. That's also a really important skill to learn. So imagine that your friend who came along and said, hey, we need to have a dog from the drawbridge. And he continued to say something, but the rest of the team was too busy focusing on trying to get the project done. You didn't really listen to what they were saying. And then you're done with your bridge. And then you look and the walkway for the dogs is about this small. And your friend says, well, that's great if I had a pug. But, you know, I actually have an Akita. And if you're wondering what an Akita is, it kind of looks like a husky but it's closer to the side of a St. Bernard. They are big dogs. So remember, it's really important to listen to diverse opinions. Everyone has different needs. It's important to listen up to make sure that the project in the end is one that suits everyone's needs. The last part I wanna talk about is appreciation. And it's appreciation for different skills, for people of different backgrounds. And this is really important to cultivate an appreciation for the differences. So I said at the beginning that I work with a group of really diverse people, and it's part of my job to make sure that I create an environment where everyone feels that they can speak up, they can listen to each other, they can communicate, and we can together try to solve the problem of how do you best cure cancer. And an appreciation is a really important part of that because if someone comes up with an idea that is sometimes not what I'm thinking, I want to approach that with a sense of appreciation. It's not always easy. I will tell you, there are times where I sort of think, oh, well, maybe I can just get convince everyone to think about my idea and maybe that's the best one. And if I just talk really loud and talk over them, well, then we'll get done sooner. But in fact, you know what happens if you do that? is that in the end, you're just stuck with your same old ideas and everyone's probably a little bit upset with each other because no one really listened. But if you sit back and listen to the different ideas, try to understand why they have a different idea or why it's important to them, well, that's when you start to have really interesting conversations. That's when you start to solve the hard problems. That's when you come up with solutions that are gonna help cure cancer. So at the beginning of my talk, I said that my trip to the Amazon rainforest was a really good metaphor for my career in STEM. We had a really diverse group of people that had lots of different skills. We had to learn to communicate with one another. And that included, for example, speaking up and listening up. So for example, when the guide said, hey, you might want to get out of the river because the piranhas in there, you bet I got out of there pretty quickly. There's also the need to really appreciate the differences that people bring to the table. And that's the way that we could create the, a great environment as a team so that we could really enjoy our trip and discover the true wonders of the Amazon rainforest. So as you all think about your careers in either STEM professions or otherwise, 
Remember that discovery takes place when you're in the right environment and that you can contribute to the right environment by being really open to new ideas and skills, learning to communicate by both speaking up and listening up and making sure that you appreciate diverse ideas because that's when the new ideas happen. And frankly, it makes things more interesting and a lot more fun. So thanks for listening and I'll pass it back to Justin. Nika, thanks so much for sharing that. I mean, I, I really, I'm hopeful that our audience was paying attention to the point that you made about diversity of skills and perspectives. I mean, when we think about STEM, it's not just these people that are sitting in laboratories and hunkered down and maybe can't communicate with each other. There's so many different things that you have to learn, but also to specialize in to be effective in STEM. You know, we need people that are good communicators, people that are empathetic, creative people, folks that can move their bodies. All these kind of folks can make substantial contributions to the STEM field. So thanks for that message. I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up for our audience. Uh, so let's move right into Q&A. Uh, some of our audience members have actually sent in questions before the show, and we're gonna have a few students who are gonna be asking you questions in person. So uh, let's go ahead and play that video for the first question. Hi, I'm Gabby. I have a question for Dr. Sovac. How did you know that you wanted to be a drug developer? Hmm. Really good question. So interestingly, I didn't know that that's what I wanted to do when I grew up. Um, I was really interested in science. I was interested in taking care of patients, but you know, I didn't even know that this career existed when I uh, start when I was in school. And I think that's one thing that's really important for all of you to remember is that things are changing so rapidly. We are learning about so many different diseases. There's all this technology. The job that you're going to end up having probably doesn't even exist right now. And so I think that's really an opportunity to think about, you know, what is it that you want to do? Enjoy what you are learning now. You don't know necessarily exactly what your job might be, um, but if you find something that you like, something that you're good at, something that you want to spend more time in the sciences, then uh, I encourage you to go ahead and do that. Cool, I appreciate that answer, um, definitely. Because, um, I mean, yeah, it definitely reflects on a lot of the experience that I've had as well in science. So here's another one about reflecting um, as you reflect on your life journey that has brought you to where you are today, what's one piece of advice that you would give your younger self? So it would probably be uh, to take some risks. You know, uh, I think if we are okay with the idea of sometimes failing, that sometimes maybe you're not gonna succeed at what you're doing, but it's something that you might be interested in, or for some reason you think it might be cool to try something out, go for it. I think it's okay. It's okay to fail. That's how we learn. That's how we learn about new and interesting things. And you know what? It's okay because the learning is really the important part of that. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, you know, a lot of the field of science and engineering, as we'll learn, and we've learned in the past uh, series that we've had is a lot of the folks that have been on have talked about their failures to get to where they are and that their path to success was not a straight one. It was a very uh, twisted and curved one. So as you were looking at your own path to success, Mika, what do you or who did you rather identify as your role models and have they changed today? Yeah, so, um, well, I'll, I'll say I had two role models probably. Uh, the first one is Marie Curie. Uh, so she uh, lived in the eight 1900s uh, and she's really one of the pioneers in the study of radioactivity, uh, which has ultimately led to our understanding of the fact that you can actually use it to treat cancer, for example. Um, so uh, she, I just loved reading about her. Uh, she actually won a couple of Nobel prizes. Um, but what I really loved was I read a book about her a biography when I was a kid and uh, there's a story about how she used to work at the dining room table and she was so engrossed in what she was doing, her, she didn't hear that her sister was building a tower of chairs behind her so that when she moved, the 
shares just came crashing down and she had no idea that they were even doing that because she was so interested and focused on the work that she was doing. I think she's just a trailblazer um, and has always been one of my heroes. Hmm. Very cool. And so what is one experience from the uh, backpacking trip that you had that remains in your mind today as a critical self uh, self growth and learning moment? So, yeah, that's a good one. Um, so it is about the need to speak up. So, you know, I was the only woman on the trip. Uh, and so I was a little bit worried. Oh, if I say I need to take a little bit more, I need to take a break uh, or have some water. Um, I first felt a little uncomfortable, but you know, the jungle is hot and humid and I needed a break. Uh, so we slowed the trip down a little bit, but what it allowed was for all of us to appreciate the Amazon, the jungle itself, all that much more. And so I saw some really cool animals and strange insects and was able to sort of watch their behavior. And it made the trip so much more interesting and so much more of a learning experience in some ways, which you know, was something I had always wanted to go down and take a look at and really appreciate just the biodiversity, all the animals, all the plants, how they've adapted to the extreme weather. Um, and it made the journey a lot more interesting. Right. Uh, and it also that alludes to a very cool opportunity that a lot of folks with STEM or science backgrounds have, and that's REUs. I think about when I was in college, uh, one of the first things I did freshman year summer was do a research experience for undergraduates and REU. And that was gave me the opportunity to have all these adventures that I never would have otherwise had. So a really cool thing to look forward to if you're planning to major in science. So uh, Mika, thanks so much. Uh, we are going to move on into our next phase of this, but we'll see you a little bit later. Sounds good. See you, Justin. All right. Well, uh, that was an absolute pleasure. Everyone, please give Dr. Mika Sovak a virtual high five, a virtual round of applause, and we're going to see her again a little bit shortly. So before we move into our next speaker session, let's take a few minutes for a brain break. Let's get out of our seats, stretch our legs, and have a little singing and dancing fun. your good energy flow. I move like this from head to toe and then I take a walk, you know. Take a flow. walk. Take a walk. Take a walk. Good, good energy, energy flow. Go oh, arm star. Yo, yo. Show us your good energy flow. I move like this from head to toe and then I dance, 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 you know. Dance, dance. This, 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 good, good energy, energy flow. flow. Yo, Cutman. Yo, yo. Show us your good energy flow. I move like this from head to toe and then I do a stretch, you know. Do a stretch. Do a stretch. Do a, do a stretch. stretch. Good, good energy, energy flow. flow. Yo, Cat. Yo, yo. Show us your good energy flow. I move like this from head to toe and then I sing a song, you know. Sing a song. Sing a song. Sing a song. Good, good energy, energy flow. flow. Yo, Rasheem. Yo, yo. Show us your good energy flow. I move like this from head to toe and then I read a book, you know. Read a book. Read a book. Read a book. Good, good energy, energy flow. flow. Yo, Sylvia. Yo, yo. Show us your good energy flow. Yo, I was sitting at the cabin and then I eat a snack, you know. Eat a snack. Eat a snack. Good energy flow. Yummy Pufferson. Yo, yo. Show us your good energy flow. I move like this from head to toe, and then I do jumping jacks, you know. Jumping jacks. Jumping jacks. Jumping jacks. Good, good energy, energy flow. flow. Yo, you. Show us your good energy flow. Show your moves. Nice one. Love it. Energy flow. Yo, everyone. Yo, yo. Show us your good energy flow. I move like this from head to toe, and then I do Thanks for joining our Go Noodle Hangout. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed. Show us your good energy flow. I think my favorite person in that one was uh, Mr. Was it McPufferson? 
<laughs> it was a funny little cartoon. So last week we showed us uh, the STEM. We showed off the STEM activity uh, for social media called "Show Us How You STEM." So if you want to, you can tag us at USA Science Fest or tag me at Mister Fascinate on Instagram and use the hashtag "Show Us How You STEM." You can share your science fair projects, how you explore nature, or how you or your loved ones are using science to save lives and more. Just show us how you STEM, and you may get a chance to appear on our final program tomorrow. And guess what, guys? You know what it's time for now, our virtual selfie. So I'll give you a few seconds here to take out your phones, get your phones ready, and we're going to snap a new picture together with a different pose. All right. So let's give you about five seconds here. Okay. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, I'm going to hold this face in position for a little bit. All right. Okay. All right. So hopefully you guys got a chance to get a cool selfie. And please tag me at Mr. Fascinate Tag at USA Science Fest and share how you guys are enjoying our session on social media. So let's get back to it. I'd like to welcome our next special guest to the program. Dr. Francis Collins is the director of the National Institutes of Health, or the NIH. As the head of our nation's medical research agency and one of the top medical research centers in the world, he is dedicated to improving human health and saving lives in the process. If you tuned in on day one of the series, you might recall that he's a passionate, a talented, and passionate musician as well. Please welcome Dr. Francis Collins. Hello. I'm Francis Collins, the director of the National Institutes of Health, and glad to have a chance to speak to you as part of the USA Science and Engineering Festival. NIH is very much a strong supporter of this and have been for the last 10 years. And though we all hoped we would be meeting in person uh, to celebrate science and look at some great demonstrations, COVID-19 seems to have had other plans. So I'm speaking to you from my home office in Chevy Chase, Maryland. I do want to say how grateful I am to the leadership of the festival, particularly the late Larry Bach, and now carried on by his wonderful wife, Diane, to make it possible for some of the excitement that's happening in STEM to be seen by lots and lots of people, even in the face of the need to do this virtually. We wanted and from NIH's perspective, to be sure, despite all of the isolation that we're experiencing, uh, to share the excitement about what's happening in biomedical research, because that's what we do. And frankly, to hope we might lure some of you into considering careers in this space, because the promise of biomedical science in the coming decades is truly unprecedented. We are going to figure out how the brain works, how those 86 billion neurons between your ears do what they do. We're going to understand precision medicine, how you can put together everything about the genome and the environmental interactions and health behaviors and diet and exercise and all of that and figure out how to keep people healthy. Uh, we are going to do all kinds of things to figure out how to treat and maybe even cure terrible diseases like cancer using immunotherapy or like sickle cell disease using gene therapy. All those things are on the on-ramp towards success and coming to be part of that could be pretty exciting for any of you who are interested in science. I just thought I'd tell you a quick word about myself and how I ended up in a scientific career. I got excited about science in a 10th grade class in high school because that science class, the very first day, had a challenge for us. Each of us was given a black box that was sealed up, it was about this big, and there was something inside it, but we weren't told what. And our task was to think of the experiments that you might try to do, many of which you couldn't do in your high school classroom, but think about what you could do if you had access to various kinds of equipment to figure out what was inside. This was really challenging. People hadn't quite asked me to think that way before. And I realized, hey, this is a detective story. That's what science is really all about. So I got hooked, by the way, it was a candle that was inside my box and I did not figure it out until I opened it up. But that really is the kind of thing that gets one excited about science, the ability to discover the unknown. And now I went from chemistry to physical chemistry, uh, to medical school, to genetics, 
I had the privilege of leading the Human Genome Project, which revealed that instruction book for human biology, which was a pretty amazing ride. And now as the director of the National Institutes of Health, it's my job to look over the whole landscape of medical research opportunities and make sure we're investing in the ones that are going to have the greatest potential to make discoveries happen and help people who are still facing what could be serious medical problems. Right now, as you might guess, because of the era we're in the middle of, 90% of my time is focused on COVID-19, working with thousands of other researchers to try to steer the effort to make discoveries about treatments that will work for this disease, to make the vaccines that we all really want to have here as soon as possible go as fast as they can. And we're making great progress there, I must say. And also to come up with better ways to get diagnostic tests available out there so that everybody who's interested in knowing whether they might be carrying this virus could find out very quickly and to have that kind of testing done right near where they are without having to have a lot of shipment of samples off to other places, so-called point of care testing. That's what I'm thinking about all day. And it is exhilarating and also it's intense uh, to try to think about how to bring all the best minds of science to tackle this threat to our world. And we are going to succeed. I wish we could finish this off tomorrow. <laughs> it's going to take months to get there, but we will get through this. So I just want to share that with you as sort of one person's trajectory. But I hope you also, as the experience you're having here with this science festival, will get a sense of just what it's like to be involved in this at this time in history when so many things are being discovered because science is a detective story, so it's satisfying in that regard. You get to chase after a, a story and figure out the answer. It's also one of the most amazing experiences you can have is to discover something that nobody knew before. That's what science gives you the chance to have that kind of moment of discovery. But more than that, it's a way to make the world a better place, whether that's figuring out ways to make our planet healthier or ourselves healthier. That's where science needs to take us. We have at the present time the best chance ever to make that happen. And in this country, the resources are generally there uh, to support people. And there are lots of great jobs waiting for you if that's the kind of career that sounds exciting to you. So please soak up everything you can in this USA Science and Engineering Festival. I'll learn what you can. And then if it seems like this is something you might want to explore, find a teacher who'd be willing to give you some advice about what to do next particularly see if you could find a way to volunteer in a research lab so you can actually get that personal experience of seeing what it's like, not just reading about it, but actually taking part in it. That's what gets people really excited, got me excited. Most scientists I know of will remember the first time they got to be in the lab where things were really being done that hadn't, didn't have a definite answer yet. They were still mysteries waiting to be solved. So I hope you will also have a chance uh, to learn about those things and ultimately solve some mysteries yourself if science appeals, appeals to you. Everybody, please stay safe, but exercise your minds, uh, learn everything you can, and maybe someday I'll bump into you in a research lab or in a clinic or somewhere where you're making discoveries about our world, because that's an amazing thing to be able to contemplate. So thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful festival. Special thanks to Dr. Francis Collins for coming in and sharing those wise words with us today. I hope you guys are ready to hear from your next speaker, Dr. Greg Gage. Dr. Greg Gage is a neuroscientist and electrical engineer who is developing tools that allow the general public to participate in hands-on neuroscience discovery. His company, Backyard Brains, offers popular learning devices, including the world's first commercially available cyborg, the RoboRoach. Yeah, a cockroach. He was recognized by President Barack Obama for being a champion of change for his commitment to citizen science. Dr. Greg Gage, please join us and I hope you have a warm welcome. How's it going, Greg? Still, we can't hear from you, you're still muted. That's all right. It happens to the best of us here. We are rolling with the punches. No worries.
Still can't hear you. Still can't hear you, Greg. All right, please stand by, folks. We're having a little bit of technical difficulties, but that's okay. We're going to get right into it. Greg has some really cool demonstrations for us. How about now? He's going to show you. Yeah, there we go. Loud and clear. Okay. This one. This one. All right. And you can hear me on this one. Okay. So, yeah. So are we Greg cool? got a lot of cool yeah. over there. He's got a lot of cool equipment to work with. I'm going to let you get straight into it, Greg. All right. Well, I cannot hear you uh, because, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, like I said, uh, this I'm a neuroscientist, but I'm more of a, a DIY neuroscientist. And so what I'm interested in is sort of solving uh, some problems about the brain. So it turns out that 20% uh, of the world has a neurological disorder. That's one out of five people. Uh, and how many cures do we have for neurological diseases? Zero, right? And so uh, you might be wondering, well, what are we doing about this? Well, it turns out that we there are a number of neuroscientists around the world and what we do is we uh, use fancy equipment at fancy universities uh, in order to understand how the brain works and hopefully figure out ways that we can sort of solve some of these diseases that are out there. Uh, and so when we look at this, it seems weird that you have to dedicate your entire life to become a neuroscientist uh, just to get access to the tools to be able to do that. It's not like that in other fields of science. For example, in astronomy, uh, you don't need to be a neuro, or sorry, an astrophysicist to be able to get access to these tools. Uh, you can do it, you know, at your home or in your backyard, and you can do it in your classrooms. Uh, but you can't do that in, in like in biology or in neuroscience uh, when we started this. And so my lab mate and I at the time decided, well, there's something we can do. We can make something like a cheap telescope, but for uh, neuroscience. It's so what we ended up inventing was a device that looks like this. It's like a little small box that will replace big racks of equipment, about $40,000 worth of equipment, and make it available so that kids can do the exact same thing that neuroscientists do, and that is record from living brain cells and to try to interpret what the code means inside of our heads. And so you and I uh, are going to do an experiment right now uh, using the brain, and we're going to do something that's, uh, that's going to answer the question of when someone taps you on the shoulder, how do you know to turn around and look, right? So there's a, a number of things that are going on inside of our nervous system to allow us to do that. Uh, but we're gonna do that first uh, with a an animal model, something we call in science an animal model. That's something that sort of will fit in for us to be able to help us understand who we are. And today we're gonna use la cucarachas. Uh, these are South American uh, cockroaches. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, understand how, how their brains work by, uh, recording from neurons inside of them. So what is the brain? The brain is made up of a series of cells. They're called neurons. Uh, neurons just look like no normal cells. They have a, like a, a cellular body. You know, They have uh, a very strange thing called a process, a, a long string that comes out of the center. We call that, in, as neuroscience, we call that an axon. Uh, and it's through this axon that reaches out to other neurons, and we're going to be able to uh, have one neuron communicate with another neuron. And it does that using a form of uh, energy called electricity. And why electricity? Because electricity is very fast. Chemicals are very slow, but electricity is fast, right? So it allows us to be able to react quickly. And so what we're going to do is we're going to be able to uh, record the action potential or spike. And this is the type of communication that happens between one cell and another one. Uh, this electrical form of, a, of an action potential is actually made up not of batteries, but we have these sodium, potassium. These are like uh, ions that are inside of our bodies that have a little charges on there. And so when the when the axons can open up and close for a second, it creates a small charge that zips all the way down to another neuron. And we're going to be able to use that spike or that action potential to be able to communicate between brain cells. And so that happens from one cell to the other cell. It hits the synapse, and then we're going to go on from there. But now. Let's ask that question again. So how do we know when someone's touching our shoulder? So we're gonna do an experiment right now um, with the cockroach, but we're, let's ask the question first, what does the cockroach life look like, right? So we're gonna look at uh, the the uh, nervous system of the human, um, and sorry, uh, that's very similar first to the cockroach. So we have a brain and a spinal cord, 
uh, that evolved about a half a billion years ago, about 500 million years ago, that type of structure came out. And what we're going to be able to, to do is we're going to use this cockroach as a stand-in to be able to, to sort of understand how that works. And so cockroaches, as you might know, run away from you when you open up the door. They're like at high speeds. It kind of freaks people out. And now we're going to find out how is it possible that the cockroach knows that you're coming to run away before you show up. And we're going to do that by doing a live experiment right now with these cockroaches. And so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, peer into the neurons that are inside the leg that are sort of little vibration sensors. They're sensing the wind of you coming up and they're going to be able to tell the brain to get out of there before you before you sort of swoosh them, right? So we're going to do this experiment by going to have a glass here of some ice water and we're going to knock out our cockroach in a very ethical way to make sure that they are going to be able to survive again another day. And I'm going to show you with a live stream here, I've got a glass of ice water. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a living cockroach and I'm gonna place him into the glass. And what you're, we're gonna notice is that over time, his behavior is gonna change. He's gonna to start to slow down. And so if we remember about what I said, mentioned about the neurons, they have little small packets that open and close uh, that allow these ions to flow through. But as things get colder, these guys are cold blooded, those are gonna to start to slow down. And when they slow down, the neurons are gonna stop firing. Uh, and when they stop firing, he's gonna stop moving and he's gonna stop feeling pain. So it's interesting to, to have a discussion now about the ethics of what we're gonna do because we're gonna be using a live animal, right? And for an experiment. And so in science, when we do that, we have to you know, ask a, a independent review board, what are the ethics of what we're doing? So we're suggesting that there is a, a problem, right? So you have to weigh the cost and benefits. So the problem is that you know 20% of the world is a neurological disorder. We're not doing what much in education to get kids more interested in becoming that. Uh, and so that's the, that's sort of the, uh, the, the benefits of it. What are the costs of the animals? So we can measure that as well. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna remove a leg from the cockroach, uh, but we can carefully measure this and see how well they survive. And we can also see that their legs regrow. So between 85 and 125 days, a new leg will be re re reborn with that one when he goes to the next molting stage. Okay. So he's slowing down. So what I'm gonna do now is I, I know that he can't feel anything. Can insects feel pain? Uh, we don't know, so we assume that they do, and so we're gonna anesthetize them. So I'm gonna now do a small surgery on him. What we used to do is we used to cut the leg off, but what we found from our research is that they actually we prefer it if you just do a gentle pull on the leg. So I'm gonna kind of zoom in here, and we're gonna sort of take off one of these legs here, and you're gonna see how this thing will just kind of just Pop right off, okay. pull it right here like that. And what we're gonna see is that the hairs are on this are on this cockroach leg are going all the way up to the brain. Even though the brain's not there, it's gonna be able to send messages because we're gonna warm up those neurons and make them wake up again. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plug it into our invention here, which we call the spiker box which is like an amplifier. And it's gonna be able to take those small bits of electricity that are inside the cockroach leg and make it big enough so that we can hear it and possibly even see it as well. So there we go. So I've got two pins in there. We need two pins for the electrical circuit to be completed. And now I'm gonna turn this on and you're gonna hear possibly for the first time what your brain will sound like. Let me turn this up. You don't hear anything yet, but I'm gonna to touch these you're going to hear a crackling sound. I'm not sure which microphone I'm using, but but as, since it's hard to hear, maybe what we can do is, is as scientists, we are very careful when we collect our data. So I'm going to put on our little recording amplifier here. And when I touch these, you're starting to see something, right? So those are the messages that are happening from the brain, or sorry, from the neurons in the skin that are going up to the brain. And, we're, and if I can zoom in on one, we're going to be able to see that. So there it is, and I'm gonna zoom in. And there it is, that's the axe potential or spike. So these are sort of increasing as I touch the, the, the leg, and that allows the brain to be able to be aware. So when I touch it, it's gonna fire, and it's gonna be able to send that message. And so even if you don't look at the left hand of your screen, let me turn this off. Even if you're not looking at the left hand of the screen, 
you can tell when I'm touching it by looking at the right hand. So that's how your brain knows when you're touching, uh, when someone's touching your shoulder. So there's a lot of information that we can get out of this. And I'm going to show you one more thing. Uh, and that is that the, the harder you touch on something, the more spikes that there are. So that's how we understand how the brain is able to be able to detect between a quiet sound or a loud sound or a light touch and a hard touch. It's not that the spikes get bigger, they just get closer together in time. And so that's what we call rate coding. And I've got room for one more experiment now. I have to wrap it up quickly, but I want to show you now that was the input of the brain that's coming in from the sensory system back out. But now I want to take a look at this, the motor system outside of the human brain. So now we're going to go back to the human model and I'm going to go ahead and place some electrodes on me. So now instead of the, uh, instead of recording from the neurons, I'm going to record from the output of my brain and I'm going to send that down into an amplifier again. And we're going to be able to listen to what happens to my brain when I uh, squeeze my hands. So I'm going to move this back over here again. I'm going to be able to see this. So when I squeeze my hand, you're hearing to hear the motor activity from me. So I'm going to move this back onto this guy. And so now, so that sound you're hearing is the output of my brain as I move my hand. And I'm going to do one last experiment really quickly, and I'm going to show you that you can take that into an Arduino. This is an Arduino experiment. Uh, an Arduino is a small computer that are used in schools often, and we're going to make a brain-machine interface. So that same signal is now going to go into this Arduino, and we programmed it so that when I move my hand, the lights will come on. All right, so this is the, the hello world of physical computing, right? So this is kind of boring, but what we can do is we've worked with some students, and they've come up with a better thing and this is a robotic hand that we can then plug in to our Arduino here. And we're going to have a brain machine interface, a DIY brain machine interface using simple low tech things, string and some wood. And so now, so as I move my hand, we're recording the output of my brain, sending it to the computer and telling the hand to move. So we can see that is actually kind of cool. So it's a brain machine interface using the neurons in my brain going to my spinal cord, out to my muscles, and being able to control a computer to do something interesting that would be useful for someone maybe who is a uh, spinal cord injured, for example. Uh, so I hope you got to see the, uh, what we're trying to do, attempting to do with Backyard Brains. We're trying to get more sort of citizen scientists, more school kids, you know, starting around third or fourth grade, start to be able to do really complex experiments that are typically done in graduate schools, uh, but make it available to help start the neural revolution. So thank you for your time. I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Dr. Greg Gage, that was awesome. Thank you for that really, really cool demonstration. I think that you sparked the curiosity and a lot of our audience members uh, about the prospect of this brain machine interface technology. I mean, you can do so many things with that from controlling prosthetics to maybe one day even texting your friends with your brain. I mean, there's it's a limitless uh, application potential for this technology. So. Let's go into some questions. We have a video question from one of our viewers and here it is. Hi, Dr. Gage. Uh, being an engineer and a neuroscientist is an interesting combination. Can you tell us a little bit more about your path? Oh, Greg, it looks like we can't hear you again. I think you have to, whatever you did last time, you have to do it again. He's got a really high tech setup over there. It's a lot of different uh, cords and cable matching <laughs> to do. But how cool is that experiment, right? Didn't think we would see a live roach surgery today. Didn't see that one coming. And guys, if you saw something that you enjoyed, you know, please tag us at USA Science Fest, tag me at Mr. Fascinate. Show us what your favorite parts of today's stream was. All right, so no, nothing. Uh, there, now, we, now we can hear you. There we go. We got you. You can hear me. Oh, good. Yes. Right. Um, <laughs> I love these live, uh, live streams. All right. Uh, so the question was uh, about being an engineer and being, uh, so we heard today earlier that the diversity is extremely important. I would argue 
that engineers make the best neuroscientists, at least electrical engineers, because the brain is an electrical organ, right? And so uh, when I was a student, I, I thought that electricity was the best thing in the world. It was really mysterious and weird. Uh, so I became an electrical engineer and I worked as an electrical engineer for about 10 years. Um, and then I found out the first time I, I, I even was interested in neuroscience, I heard a neuron spike, that thing that we saw on the screen today for the first time. And as an electrical engineer, I was thinking like, what is this? I've been going around my entire life with these things in my brain, these electrical properties that I knew nothing about. And so uh, I switched over to STEM and I will be able to, uh, was able to then uh, figure out that I'm able to contribute uh, a lot to the field having a, ba a background electricity. Hmm. So that's a really cool perspective. Uh, Caitlin, an eighth grader from Delaware asks, at what age did you realize you wanted to be a neuroscientist? I guess you kind of touched on that a little bit. And do you need to yeah, know no, math late, well? I was a late bloomer, uh, <laughs> and so that's one of the things that I was I was well into my life. I think I, I think I started my PhD at thirty five. Um, but the uh, the one of the reasons why we're doing right now, if had I had known what I what I uh, know now, I would have started this field like uh, about you know at least twenty years before what I did. So. I'd like to be able to, uh, to to be able to inspire some students to be able to think that this is a, a career choice for them, so that it's something that they can participate in. Uh, and I just want to mention to our to our students at home that our cockroaches are alive; they will come back to life again in a little bit. So they're just they're cold blooded right now, so they're just sort of slowly warming back up again when I take them out of the bath. We have a, a place called Shady Acres, which they're going to be able to recover and regrow their legs. Very cool. Yeah. And uh, yeah, thanks for thanks for making that point. Uh, so here's one. A 10th grader from Texas asks, what are some questions about the brain that neuroscientists are still trying to answer? Ah, yeah, there's a lot. So there's a uh, one of the biggest questions is we know a lot about the inputs of the brain. Um, we have, we know, for example, the sensory system, we got that all kind of figured out a little bit. We know that uh, rate coding, which is what we showed today, has something to do with uh, how the intensity of, of stimuli come in. The output, the motor cortex, we know that fairly well. Like how, how does motor, we can be able to decode things from brain machine interface and make robotic hands move. You have to do that, you have to know how the coding works. But that in-between bit, the consciousness, the stuff that lets you understand that I'm a speaker and I'm, you know, you're, you're, you're integrating your, the voice of me and with some knowledge that you have into some percept of an idea, uh, that is not very well understood yet. And that's one of the, you know, the holy grails of neuroscience to be able to figure that out. How do, how do these neurons in our brain uh, turn into behaviors that we do? And that's a very interesting question. And that's what I think most people, uh, a lot of neuroethologists are, are sort of spending their time thinking about is how do we arrive consciousness from from these cells? Hmm. There's a lot of other interesting questions here, but uh, unfortunately, we are running short on time and have to transition into our next segment. So thanks again, Greg, for that really cool demonstration. Uh, well, thank and you, uh, please, everyone, take a moment to give Greg a virtual high five, a virtual round of applause. And uh, he's actually not leaving us just yet. So we'll take a little bit of time here and we'll welcome Dr. Mika Solvak back to the program. All right, so now we got the full powerhouse here, the, uh, the scientists that are working on saving lives in the flesh with us once again. Uh, really quick question for both of you guys, and we can start with Mika. Have you guys picked up any hobbies or special interests during this time? So I have, it's a hobby that I've had before. Um, I love doing pottery. Uh, and I've done it on and off for years. Um, the difference is that I usually go to a studio and during this time I actually brought the clay home and set myself up at the dining room table and try to make some pots that we can hopefully use uh, at a later date when I can finally get back into the studio and fire them. So not science related, uh, but it's something that I really love to do. Cool. What about you, Greg? Uh, interestingly uh, enough, I, I 
we started to do a summer program where we were going to use uh, a beehive to be able to train bees to find uh, foraging locations. But uh, so because of COVID-19, that beehive showed up my house. And so I'm learning uh, again. I was a beehive uh, when I was a kid with my mom. But uh, yeah, learning how to keep track of a, a hive and make sure they're healthy and stuff like that. So uh, if, you, if you're ever in Ann Arbor, if you see someone running around with a bunch of bees behind it, it's probably me. So. <laughs> <laughs> really really interesting wow bees cockroaches i guess you just you do it all uh well okay guys uh, it looks like we are running short on time and unfortunately um, we have a lot of cool questions from the audience that we weren't able to answer this time but i had an amazing time chatting with both of you all and i personally appreciate from the bottom of my heart the work that both of you guys are doing to one inspire us to pursue careers in stem and to be those stem heroes that young people, including myself, can look up to. So thanks again for joining us. And I hope to see you guys really soon again in person, maybe in real life. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks, Justin. All right, thanks guys. So I hope you guys enjoyed today's fourth installment of XTEM All Access. Please tune in tomorrow for the same, or at the same time for the 1 p.m. Eastern final session for Life Beyond Our World. We're going to be hearing from NASA astronauts, including uh, Christina Cook and a NASA systems engineer, Boba Bobic Ferdowsi. And we'll have a special guest appearance from Dr. Jessica Meir, who just returned from the International Space Station a few weeks ago. And don't forget, you can submit your questions in advance for a better chance of getting a shout during our program. Check your email for the link or go ahead and submit your questions on our social media pages. Before we say goodbye for today, I'd like to thank our sponsor, AstraZeneca, for supporting this event. AstraZeneca would like to invite students, parents, and teachers to take a virtual field trip and learn more about their Generation Health program. Go to HowSciencePowersUs.com or sing the link below with a video player to learn more. I'll see you tomorrow for more STEM inspiration, and don't forget to show us how you STEM. Tag us at USA Science Fest and use the hashtag show us how you STEM. We'll be sharing some of our favorite posts during tomorrow's final episode, so be sure to tag us for an opportunity to appear on the program. Thanks again, folks. I'm Justin Schaefer, Mr. Fascinate, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.